So good evening. So f for those of you who don't know me, I'm Des Brown. I'm an honorary fellow of St. Cat's. I'm a Labour politician and I'm a member of the House of Lords. And that is the proper order. Okay. Um, so I think before, so I welcome you all here this evening for what I guarantee will be an interesting and informative meeting. I'm here with colleagues of mine and we all have a number of things in common, but we were all ministers in the Northern Ireland office. And my experience is as a very kind of special subbreed of politician. All of them tell anybody who will listen that these, it was the best ministerial job they ever had. In fact, I remember sharing an aircraft back with uh, Peter Brook, who was Secretary of State for Northern Ireland for a period of time when I was on the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee with him. And as we flew over Northern Ireland, he was looking wistfully down on Northern Ireland and he said, you know, Des, he said that was the best time of my political career. He said, I liked even the people who were trying to kill me. Anyway, so, um, so this e event this evening will consist of a conversation and then a question and answer. And the focus will be the challenges of delivering the Good Friday Agreement. So a lot has been said and a lot has been lit, written about the agreement itself, but much less about the continuing challenges of delivering its terms. So given recent history, you know, the current Brexit-related significance of the agreement and its terms, particularly the perennial issue of identity, freedoms of movement and trade across the border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, this event conceived some months ago, um, increasingly has become more and more timeless and more and more relevant to the politics of the United Kingdom and now taking place in the middle of an election campaign where the Good Friday Agreement uh, has assumed a greater prominence than it has in any general election since 1999. It is right in the centre of things. So the first phase of this, uh, of this evening will be moderated by my a colleague, Dr. Neve Gallagher. Neve comes from County Armagh, Northern Ireland. Um, she comes from the city of Newry, um, where I have extended family. Um, so we had a lot in common from the moment we met. And about five or six sentences into our conversation, we conceived this event some time ago, and we're pleased to see it come to fruition. So Neve is a lecturer in modern history and Irish political history. Her research interests include a focus uh, on the social and political history of modern Ireland and its relationship with Britain. Her doctoral thesis and forthcoming book, <laughs> which is available in all good bookshops and online and will be in due course. She couldn't say that, but I promised I would do it for her. <laughs> is uh, a revisionist history of Irish involvement in the Great War. And she won for that the St. Catherine's Prize for Distinction in Research when she was a postgraduate student here at the college. So it will be, I guarantee you, a bestseller, Neve. They will all buy it. OK, but um, so this is a great untold story in our view, but has become uh, increasingly recognised by some of the important conversations that took place um, between the then uh, Irish ambassador in London, a man called Datio Kelly, whom we all know, who is a brilliant guy. Um, so this is, this is part of our future, um, as well as part of our history, I think, and appreciation of this. So I intend to hand over to Neve now, who will set the scene for us and will moderate the first part of the event. I will then return um, to moderate the question and answer. So just two things. Very simply, we don't plan a fire alarm. If it goes off, it is the real thing. The exits are clearly uh, marked and the collection space is the big green part outside. Okay. And secondly, if you have a mobile phone, please just switch it off now. Make sure it's switched off or at least muted, but switched off preferably unless you're a first responder. Thank you. Thank you, Des. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this joint panel discussion hosted by St. Catherine's College in conjunction with the Modern Irish and Modern British History Seminars at the University of Cambridge. 
My name is Neve Gallagher. I'm a lecturer at the Faculty of History and a fellow of this college. And I am delighted to chair this panel discussion this evening. I would like to extend a warm welcome to our panelists, Paul Murphy, John Reed, and Angela Smith, who have traveled to be with us this evening. And a special thanks to Angela for stepping in at the last moment, as unfortunately Peter Hain is unable to be with us tonight. I also wish to welcome some of our other guests this evening, Gerald Eingley, Deputy Head of Mission at the Embassy of Ireland, Martina Muller, Member of the Northern Ireland Assembly for Belfast South, Baroness Fairhead, former Ministry of, Minister of State at the Department for International Trade and an Honorary Fellow of St Catharines, Dr Margaret O'Callaghan, Acting Director of the Institute of Irish Studies at Queen's University Belfast, Sir Christopher Clark, Regis Professor of History at the University of Cambridge, and Professor Alexandra Walsham, Chair of the Faculty of History at the University of Cambridge. In a moment, I will invite Des to properly introduce our panellists, but I want to begin by saying a few words about why we are so privileged to have them here this evening. Together, our panel tonight offer unique perspectives on three distinct and interconnected features of the peace process in Northern Ireland. Firstly, the design of a major element of the Good Friday Agreement itself and the drafting of key documents. Secondly, the crucial process of decommissioning of IRA weapons. And finally, the extraordinarily sensitive task of managing the highly volatile situation that followed the formal signing of the peace process. It is important to remember that the Good Friday Agreement was not the end of the journey to restore peace in Northern Ireland. The 10 years that followed were marked by a seesaw effect, whereby the governance of Northern Ireland oscillated between direct rule from Westminster and attempts to bring about a new devolved parliament at Stormont. Our panellists this evening were intimately involved in this process and their efforts were crucial in bringing about the establishment of a new Northern Ireland Assembly and Executive in 2007. In one way, the Good Friday Agreement could therefore be seen as one of the series of devolutionary settlements that reshaped the inner life of the United Kingdom. But among these agreements, the Good Friday Agreement stands out because it was not just an act of devolution, but it marked an end to the 30-year conflict known as the Troubles and was a landmark in the history of 20th century Anglo-Irish relations and internal relations within Northern Ireland. It was signed on the 10th of April 1998, after two years of multi-party talks, sanctioned with the support of international partners. The document itself was a feat of diplomacy, signed by Northern Irish, Irish and British representatives. It set out the terms of a new multi-party accommodation within Northern Ireland and a new devolved government based on non-violence and power sharing between the two main communities who live there nationalists and unionists, and the respective political parties. The agreement marked a new departure in the politics of Northern Ireland as well as the politics of the two islands. Since 1972, Northern Irish affairs had been governed by Westminster through the system of direct rule, which had been brought in as a result of mass civil unrest, the inability of the existing Northern Irish government to contain the crisis, and the participation of civilians and the Northern Irish state in acts of violence. These were the early years of the Troubles, a conflict which left more than three and a half thousand people dead, mainly in Northern Ireland, but also in the Republic of Ireland, Britain and in mainland Europe. It caused billions of pounds in damage and has left mental, physical and emotional legacies that weigh heavily on, on individuals, families and communities. It is hard to convey to someone who did not live in Northern Ireland the all-encompassing nature of the Troubles. I grew up there in the 1980s and the 1990s, and many of my childhood memories were formed with the conflict as a backdrop to everyday life. Checkpoints were a regular occurrence when I went to school, and a policeman would ask my dad, who usually drove me, the typical series of questions. Driving licence, please. Where have you come from? Where are you going? What's your date of birth? How long have you lived at this address? A small platoon of soldiers were never that far away, 
couched in a hedgerow and camouflage on the lookout for suspicious activity. They were there to support the police as checkpoints made good targets for the IRA. There was a weird combination of menace and banality in these encounters. The uniforms, guns and interrogations stirred unease, but the young men on guard around the checkpoints seemed both tense and bored, even as he pointed their guns in our direction. I grew up on the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, where the security apparatus of the conflict was in plain sight. But this did not stop ordinary life from continuing. The villages on the border afforded me plenty of opportunities to pursue my teenage ambition of playing Irish music in pubs on perhaps, in hindsight, too many nights of the week. And while my soundtrack of those years was filled with music and laughter, there was also the constant hum of military helicopters because we lived close to the village of Fork Hill, a nondescript little place, which happened to have one of the largest army installations in Northern Ireland. <coughs> there was a geographical patchiness about this conflict. My experience near the border was doubtless very different from that of my contemporaries growing up in less militarised areas, and different again from those who grew up in notorious interface areas, such as the Shankill and Falls Road area in Belfast, where rioting and violence were part of the texture of everyday experience. Nevertheless, I think it's true to say that over the course of 30 years, a generation of people grew up with no other reality than the abnormal reality of an irregular war. Some realities were indeed shared no matter where one lived. The news was constantly filled with events and developments related to the Troubles and later the peace process. The political parties from Northern Ireland, which were involved in the multi-party talks, including those that refused to take part, were generally structured along political and religious lines, reflecting the widespread communal divisions which have had a much longer history in the history of Northern Ireland, a reality which has not changed very much today. It is really hard to convey to someone who has not grown up in this environment the depth of those divisions and the seemingly impossible task of overcoming them. Given the polarised identities of 1990s Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement really was an astonishing achievement. On the 22nd of May 1998, that agreement was put to the people on the island of Ireland in the form of two referendums. One was held in the Republic, while the other was held in Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, copies of the agreement were sent to every household. And when I was home recently, I find the copy that had been sent to mine. And here it is here. It had the caption, it's your decision, making it clear that an opportunity for change was in the hands of the people. 81% of people turned out to vote in that referendum. 71% of people voted yes. This was an overwhelming vote for change, a true watershed moment in the politics of these two islands. There is something about these big historical events that seems impossible. And suddenly when they happen, they seem inevitable in retrospect. It's very difficult for us, from our anterior perspective, to recapture a sense of how improbable that outcome seemed before our panelists this evening helped to make it a reality. The panel discussion and questions which will follow are being recorded this evening, as I'm sure you have noticed and a link to this talk will be shared with you when it is ready. But I would now li like to re-invite Des Brown to reintroduce our speakers. Thank you again for coming, and I hope you enjoy this conversation tonight. Thanks, Thanks Thank you very much indeed, Neve. So I'm not going to take very long. Um, in aggregate, these three politicians have about 90 years of service at a very high level. Um, and almost everything that they have done is now Googleable. <laughs> so <laughs> you can find it if you want it. I'm just going to highlight a few things to say. And don't believe it all if you Google it. <laughs> you can certainly believe it about him. Uh, so I'm just going to... Uh, kind of set the scene a little more. I mean, already Neve has done that for us, but so, so Paul Murphy 
Uh, these people are all friends of mine. Whether that friendship will survive these few words will be a challenge. But Paul, Paul Murphy, who was Labour M MP for Torfain between 1987 and 2015, um, was appointed to the House of Lords in 2015. So, so he served in the Cabinet uh, under both Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. But and most importantly, upon Labour's election in 1997, with a new government determined to achieve peace in Northern Ireland, Paul became Minister for Political Development between 1997 and 1999. So Paul was Mo Molum, uh, Mo Molum's deputy as they worked closely on the talks that culminated in the signing of the historic Good Friday Agreement. As you will hear from him, I'm sure, in this conversation, um, he was intimately involved in that process. And, and to some degree, only those in the know uh, are aware of just how important Paul was to the terms of the eventual agreement. Um, most people associate all of that with Mo Moll. I mean, she deserves an enormous amount of credit for it, but so too does Paul. So um, he then left Northern Ireland and he went to um, manage the process of devolution in Wales as the Secretary of State for Wales, which he did successfully. And then Tony Blair asked Paul to return to Northern Ireland as Secretary of State where he served until, um, in, in 2002, and he served until 2005. So he's able to talk not just about, about the formation of the agreement, but about how it was implemented, because he was substantially responsible for the successful implementation of it to the extent that that has been successful. So uh, John Reid, um, Lord Reid of Cardowan, um, from 1987 until uh, 2010, was the Labour MP for what started off as Motherwell North, then became, because of boundary changes, ha Hamilton North, and then subsequently, I think, became known as... Sorry, sorry Hamilton North and Bells Hill, to be precise, then became Ad Adrian Schott's. OK, so... Interesting combination, if you know the West of Scotland, Adrian Schatz for a man who went on to be the chairman of Celtic. Anyway, so he, he, um, he's well known for many things, but it's kind of summed up in this phrase by many people. He was Tony Blair's Mr. Fix-It. He was a man who got this kind of accursed label that I enjoyed for a period of time, which was he was a safe pair of hands, which meant that you, you were moved around. He was moved around because he was a safe pair of hands. I moved around um, in government quite a lot because I liked to get out of town before the sheriff came to town. Um, so he held nine ministerial jobs in nine years. Uh, early in that, in January 2001, after Peter Mandelson's second resignation, John was appointed as Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. I'm just going to steal one of his best lines here. When I worked with him in Northern Ireland as Secretary of State, um, he used to tell people that the day he was appointed, in the morning he was on the Today programme, which he was never off. Um, he was on the Today programme defending Peter Mandelson, and by the evening he had his job. Anyway, so don't get him to defend your job. Um, so he was the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland from January 2001 to October 2002. And then Angela Smith. Well, Angela deserves... Uh, a significant amount of credit for coming here today. We had Paul uh, Peter Hain um, set up to do this, but Peter, who, who many of you will know, has a very significant history in relation to South Africa um, and the anti-apartheid movement here in the United Kingdom, um, was, uh, was scheduled to give evidence to a commission in South Africa over this period, had worked it all out so that he could get back here. But then at the last moment, the minister whom he was to spend... The, the last meeting of his time there changed the meeting from one day to the next and he was left with Hobson's choice um, and having spoken to me I told him just to have the meeting with the minister we would get somebody and we did and we've got an excellent contributor to this uh, discussion this evening in Angela Barnes Smith of Basildon she was MP for Basildon from 1997 until 2010 um, and uh, was appointed a life peer in, in, in 2010 in 2002, when I was, um, when I was uh, in, in, in the ministerial team in Northern Ireland and devolution was suspended, um, she was appointed to augment the team because we had to take over this significant number of other uh, responsibilities. And she spent uh, a significant amount of time there, um, beyond the time that I spent there and, and, and worked under both John and, and Paul and then eventually became the Minister for Victims. But the time that she was there, 
she was, well, she did everything, to be honest. I mean, she did everything, except she tells me agriculture, finance, and social development. Um, she was described as a one-woman cabinet, and indeed she was, and, and I had some limited experience of, uh, of what that is, is like. So we're extremely grateful to you, Angela, for rearranging your whole day. You helped launch the Labour Manifesto this morning in Birmingham and now have <laughs> taken a train down here, and you're going back to Bognor Regis tomorrow. So thank you very much indeed. It's a delight to have you here, and you've certainly improved the kind of diversity ratio of this panel, <laughs> which is a breathe, I breathe a sigh of relief about too. So she's Labour Leader in the Lords and Shadow Leader of the House. She has a fantastic batting average. She tells me that she has, well, she didn't actually tell me this, I researched it. She has enjoyed about 100 defeats and concessions from the government <laughs> since she's been there. Um, those of us who have sat through that know why that's the case. But anyway, we'll not go into that. It's not what we're here for tonight. So I just want to get back to Neve just for a minute here before I hand over. <laughs> so Neve has many skills, but she is a talented fiddler. Um, and she's performed in many places. And when I was reading about her, I discovered that she had performed with Michael Flatley's Lord of the Dance and other well-known artists within the world of Irish traditional music. Those of you who are quick-witted will have got there ahead of me. I'm going to hand over back to you now to Dance with the Lords, Neve. <laughs> Thank you, Des. Paul, you first yeah. visited Northern Ireland in 1995 as a deputy on the Shadow Northern Ireland team. What made the biggest impression on you during that visit? Well, as you can see, I've got a name written that's not unassociated with the island of Ireland. And um, I suppose I knew I'd been a history lecturer before I became an MP. The history of the place, but nothing nothing had prepared me for what I encountered in 1995. Mm -hmm. I had been the Shadow Minister for Wales, and then when Tony Blair took over, he um, <clears throat> uh, asked Mo to ask me to become the uh, deputy to her then. And of course, that meant, inevitably, one of the very first things you do was to visit the place. And the first thing that struck me were the police stations. Mm -hmm. They were fortresses. You know, I was used to a police station in my part of the United Kingdom, which was very different from a police station in Newry or Armagh or Belfast, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So it was the security issue that immediately struck me um, when I went there. The other thing was a much happier thing, was that I was struck immediately by the friendliness of the place mm -hmm. from both sides of the community, incidentally. And um, it might have been a decade or two before um, as a Catholic, would I have been accepted by Ian Paisley's party? Mm -hmm. But by the time I had arrived, the answer was yes. Uh, and John would have experienced the same some years later. So the world had changed to a certain extent, but to <coughs> me, the immediate impression, this is a part of the country which is so tremendously different from the rest of it. And, of course, uh, the other thing that struck me as the weeks and months went on, was talking to people about the enormous impact that 30 years of troubles had on their lives. And there wasn't a single family or person I met which wasn't unaffected by it, mm -hmm. very often by death, certainly by um, some sort of injury, mental or physical. Mm -hmm. And so the, and the other thing was, I think, that I had been used, I suppose, to um, party politics and the party politician and the Labour politician. But when you went there, you did get the distinct impression that you were doing something which was, in a sense, above the normal political issues of the day. You were part of a, a system of a movement trying to improve this place. So those were the initial impressions Great. that Paul I got when I went to Northern Ireland a long time ago. Thank you. And of course, in May 1997, Labour won that very famous general election. What was different about New Labour's approach to Northern Ireland than previous Conservative administration? And that was, this is a question for the panel. 
Well, if I can start off then, because I've been appointed the political development minister, sometimes called the talks minister. But because you're an island, you're actually the listening minister um, to all the different sides. Um, so I was embroiled in nothing other effect. I was the finance minister, but that was a part-time job. Essentially, it was dealing with the talks in a very sophisticated, constructed system of uh, trying to deal with the um, creation of what became the Good Friday Agreement. And uh, ultimately, I suppose, um, what struck me about that was that there was a new government and the newness of the government, and the size of the majority, by the way, huge majority, fresh, totally different, and incidentally, not long afterwards, the new Irish government as well, mm -hmm. um, just created the space which was needed and a different approach. And inevitably, of course, uh, two prime ministers with, for whom I had the highest regard and still do, Tony Blair and Bertie Ahern, without them there'd be no Good Friday Agreement. And Paul, if I, if I jump in there and say, how high up the agenda was Northern Ireland for <coughs> Tony Blair? Right at the top. Right at the top. No question about that. Um, he was inheriting Gladstone's My Mission is to Pacify Ireland, I suppose, but he, he, he certainly, absolutely lived, lived Northern Ireland, as did Bertie Ahern. Mm -hmm. And for those 18 months in the lead up to the, uh, or less than that, to the Good Friday Agreement, literally both prime ministers mm -hmm. lived there as I did, of course, John, uh, in dealing with all these issues. True. And John, you want to say a few words? Well, you asked the question what was different between New Labour's approach and, and the previous, presumably Conservative <coughs> approach. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be a bit provocative. Never. Um, <laughs> I think that the people who were put in the positions of power in Northern Ireland by the Labour government had more empathy, more understanding and more experience uh, of the Northern Irish situation than those previously. That's not to say that the previous Secretaries of State had not been good people. They were good people. Paddy Mayhew and, and uh, Peter Brook and so on. But they came from a certain social class. Uh, I mean, one of the Shinners once said to me that, I mean, they spoke differently. Mm -hmm. You know, it was probably sort of posh. And one of the Shinners once said to me that, well, the Godfather made you an offer you couldn't refuse. You know, these guys made you an offer you couldn't understand <laughs> because, because just of the way they spoke. So, I mean, if you were brought up as I was, as a working class Catholic, albeit more lapsed than, than Paul, you didn't need a briefing book on Northern Ireland. And in some ways, this was a challenge to the politicians. It certainly must have been a challenge to Ian Paisley. Because first of all, they gave him a woman, Mo Mollum, then a gay, <coughs> Peter Mandelson, then a lapsed Catholic before they walked up to the full Catholic. They took it, <laughs> they took it gradually, you know. Um, but I, I do think, although that I'm putting that in a joking fashion, I think there was an understanding and an empathy because of our background with the people there. It was a great place to be because... For me, it was just like the west of Scotland, uh, with guns, unfortunately, for a, for a period of, of time. But you could understand both sides of the community. And I think Momola made a fantastic difference. And I'd like to think that most of the ministers after her, because of their own background, were able to do it. doesn't mean to say you were liked or trusted or anything, but it... It made it a bit easier, Neve. So what was different about Mo Mullum's approach than previous Secretaries of State? Well, I think Mo, initially, without Mo, it would have been much more difficult for the Republicans to come to the table. That's my view. There may be some Republicans in the audience who would disagree. But um, that was both a huge advantage because Mo's style was so informal, so removed from what had been used previously, and, yeah, and she went to the prison to talk to, to yes. prisoners, mm -hmm. you know. Which I advised would, against, and I was wrong. Sorry? <laughs> sorry? Which I advised against, and I was wrong. Perhaps, was you can, she, perhaps you can say a bit about that for yeah, the Yeah, I mean, Mo was a real catalyst, don't you think? Oh, I do. I mean, um, she, she left a lot of the detail to me, and a lot of the smooth and the charm into herself, um, <laughs> which, which worked. Of course, you will recall that she'd had this um, diagnosis of... Uh, tumour, 
Um, and so by the time that she'd arrived as Secretary of State, she had, had a wig um, because of radiotherapy. And every now and again, she'd take it off and put it on the table and completely disarm the poor devils who were in front of her, trying to work out whatever it was they were talking about. But she had a way about her, and she was absolutely constantly thinking and talking about it. She'd phone me up in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning. I said, what on earth are you for? Because she called me Murph. She said, Murph, I'm thinking about I meet him with Paisley or Trimble or whoever it might be the following morning. I said, but it's three o'clock. Go to bed. We'll sort something out. But she was there all the time thinking and so different from the normal politician. This was, I think, the great thing about Mo. She was completely out of character for politicians. And that was the great um, uh, benefit she had. But on the prison... I can say that you're off your bloody head going in there. And she was absolutely spot on. She went into the prisoners, in this case, to see loyalists. And I just thought it would be a um, complete flop. But in fact, it turned over to be exactly the opposite. So she had a feel. She had a nose for what was the right thing. Perhaps it was because she had a feminine touch about her. It may well have been that there was something different about having a woman there. Because... Attitudes in Northern Ireland weren't most modern, if you like, uh, towards women politicians at that time. Or later. Or later. <laughs> uh, you can say that. I couldn't possibly comment. But, the, but she was different from that. But she was a woman of stupendous character and persuasion. What and was therefore think? able to deal with issues which I don't think I could have dealt with. Mm. As I said, she left the mechanics it to me. But then she dealt with the issues which perhaps only she could deal with. Angela, what do you think? I think we've got to the nub of it in sort of in several ways, but it just struck me. I wasn't there until 2002, and talking to people, I think Northern Ireland got tired of people saying Northern Ireland is a priority for the government, because governments say that <coughs> about so many issues. You hear it at dispatch box time and time again, oh, yes, this is an absolute priority for the government. And yet when we came in in 1997, there was a different mood in the country generally, and it really, really was that priority. Mm -hmm. I think the class thing that John mentions is absolutely spot yeah. on. Mm -hmm. um, our accents were different, we sounded different, and there was a relate. And the thing that I noticed particularly um, was we'd call people out on both sides. Mm -hmm. So you would engage with people from both sides, but you were well prepared to say, no, you're wrong. It, and it was a different kind of engagement. I arrived in Northern Ireland in 2002, and I remember s going for dinner with John, who was Secretary of State, Des was there, Jane Kennedy and Ian Pearson had come with me. And they sat around with officials. And to be honest, half the conversation was going way over my head. They were so intense on what we were doing. And then we had a discussion on, on every issue, whatever the discussion was, we'd all be sent to talk to people from different political parties. And that level of engagement, even for the smaller parties, not just the leaders, but other um, where people elected as MPs, the MLAs, there was a really solid engagement at every level. And I have to say, I think that's what's been missing in more recent years, that level engagement with so many people, because that's what makes a difference. It was a talking. So I think it was engaging, it was sounding people, it was understanding the issues, and it was really just being prepared to receive as well as impart information. Great, thank you. Well, moving slightly away from the British government and to say a few more words about those talks that were mentioned, uh, the United States, of course, played a major role in the multi-party talks from 1996 until 1998 under the leadership of Bill Clinton and, of course, with Senator George Mil Mitchell chairing those arrangements. How did this international dimension change the dynamic of the negotiations? Um, enormous. Uh, by the way... That's what you're calling for now. So Europe as well. Mm. I mean, the idea that the membership of the European Union was irrelevant, which had been put about, is nonsensical. Absolutely. Um, the fact that we were in the same club and were able to meet as ministers all the time, not just in formal meetings about Northern yeah, Ireland, mm -hmm. but in anything, perhaps once, twice, three times a day, ministers and officials would meet in Brussels and elsewhere. So the, and the money and the support that came... I took the entire assembly to Brussels after we'd... Elected them. Every single member, bar a few, um, on both sides, obviously. And it was so important. But on the American side, that was critical to it. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, because of George Mitchell, you cannot conceive of a more professional and sophisticated and good politician than George Mitchell, who had been the majority leader in the Senate. 
um, he foxed Paisley and his companions who thought of, that he might be a typical um, sort of survivor of Ireland like me because of his name and because he was a Catholic, but he was a Lebanese Catholic. And, they couldn't, and Paisley couldn't quite work out what a Maronite was. And that, and that was different from normal. But he succeeded in wooing both sides in a way that I've never seen before, to be perfectly honest. He was absolutely brilliant. He came to Northern Ireland last um, year to celebrate the 20 years anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. And even in his mid-80s, there is something about him which is unique. And so he, they gave us George Mitchell. Also, of course, the um, uh, president, Clinton, and Hillary Clinton. And then later, George Bush George as well, Bush, yeah. to be fair to him. Um, they all were committed to the Northern Ireland peace process. And above all, of course, Irish America <coughs> was actually changed in this period. For a long time, as a lot of you know, Irish America was absolutely geared to what's one side of the argument. You can't make peace with one side only, you've got to have two sides. And they became completely committed to the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and John and I and Angela would have gone many, many times as we did to, to the United States to talk to people on the Hill, but also to talk to influential people in Irish America. 40 million people in, in the United States claim Irish heritage. Um, and it's so very important to have had that support on our side. Without it, it's a truism to say, no good for Friday agreement. And John, why was the British government willing to accept international help in what could conceivably have been seen as a domestic issue? Because it couldn't be resolved without, if you technically, an international group of colleagues called the Republic of Ireland. Yeah. That's the first step. Um, you'd, I mean, th this problem, as I bore everybody to death with this, it didn't start in 1969, which is the assumption everybody makes. Does anybody, can anybody take a guess when it started, if it wasn't 1969? 1690. Go on, you just keep going back. <laughs> because I actually starts in 1169, <coughs> which two Irish chieftains are at war and, and one of them has the great idea of inviting the English, actually the Normans, the French who conquered England, over to help them out. And of course they arrived there and they had kind of run out of land in England a hundred years after the Norman conquest, sailed into the Wexford estuary to help the guy out, won his little war and thought, this looks okay, we'll take this and it'll be all over in a month. That was 1169. So, I mean, basically, you, you go going through Cromwell, and people remember this. Mm -hmm. This is the amazing thing. I mean, you think 1969 is a long while ago. Well, it's yesterday in, in Irish culture and memories. I mean, people remember 1690 as though it was last week, the 1798 Great Irish Rebellion, the myths, the folk songs, the history, <coughs> Kelly the Boy from Calan, you know, Derry's Walls and so on. It's a real living thing. So when you come to that, it, it, it's the longest running conflict in the world. Israel-Palestine, yeah. 60 years passing. So when you come to this, you have to bring into play all the forces, not just the Americans, but remember the decommissioning was carried out by a Norwegian and by uh, a Canadian course, general. Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember getting in touch unsuccessfully because he wouldn't help us with, with uh, Nelson Mandela to try and get persuade the Republicans, the Shinners, to move in a particular direction. Um, Europe was absolutely essential. That was the framework because we were equal partners with the old opponent, the Republic of Ireland. Um, and we were dealing with what had been England's first colony. Um, so, I mean, that international dimension was absolutely essential. And it was a good thing, a positive thing, because it meant that the people in Northern Ireland that don't get us wrong, we made a contribution, right? But that's all. I mean, Bertie Ahern, the Taoiseach Prime Minister of Ireland, Brian Cowan, Dahe, who, who was mentioned by Des, uh, and the people in Northern Ireland itself, Gerry Adams, Martin McGuinness, 
Eventually, Ian Paisley, David Trimble, John Hume, they showed immense courage. People whose names aren't remembered from the UVF, David Irvin, yeah. one of the best politicians I ever <clears throat> met there, f uh, former member, uh, former terrorist, um, loyalist. They, and, and they were therefore fetid by the world. It was the only thing, really, they got out of apart from peace. And John, I mean, these are all very big personalities. Martin McGuinness, Gerry Adams, David Trimble, right? The list could really go on. How did you get people, as a panel, the panel can answer this, how did you get people with such different views to work together? Well, first of all, I wish some of them were around today because yeah. I believe they would have had the stature because they'd been there, seen it and done it and they could carry with credibility their own side and make a compromise. <coughs> Uh, and I wish that, that in Northern Ireland at the moment with a compromise that could get the assembly back up and running. Um, look, I only know one way of <coughs> doing things and I think Paul and Angela are the same uh, and Mo certainly was and that is you be as straight and as honest with people as you can um, and I found, as Paul did, that obviously as a Brit you were regarded by suspicion all round. Um, coming from my background, I was probably regarded with suspicion from the other side, from the unionist and loyalist side. But gradually you break it down, you know. I mean, Ian Paisley, who was regarded as the ultra loyalist, never once referred to me on radio or television as a Catholic. No. He very often referred to me as a Celtic supporter, which was kind of a so. euphemism in Northern Ireland for the same thing. <laughs> But there was, a, there, was a, there was an underlying empathy there between us. I remember one morning in the back of a car, a small anecdote, very quickly. I'm sitting in the back of the car, which, you know, as Paul would tell, is a four-turn armoured jag. And you're driving and the phone went and my private secretary was sitting and it was one of these big phones with a cord on it. And I heard them saying, good morning, Dr Paisley. How are you? <laughs> yes. Yes. No, we're in the car at the moment. And there was a... And then he put his hand over it and he said to the Secretary of State, Dr Paisley wants to talk to you. Shall I tell him you're busy? And I said, how can I be busy in the back of a car? <laughs> right? So he put him on to me and this voice, which we became so familiar was it, Secretary of State, I was listening to you on the radio this morning. You'll need to be going to confession. <laughs> 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 and I'd say, yes, Dr. Paisley, and it'll not be three Hail Marys, it'll be whole decades of the rosary with the lies you were telling. You know? So, despite the differences, there's a recognition among you of where you come from, you don't hide it, and you try to get the thing that is your only objective, which is a peaceful, prosperous Northern Ireland. But of course, Paisley said no for such a long time, right? And he, he championed, yeah. he, he did, and we'll come to that. He championed and promoted uh, against the agreement, right, in his campaigning. And there were ultimately three strands in this agreement, Paul, that you were very in involved with, uh, with creating, particularly strand one, that strand of internal relations within Northern Ireland. I mean, how did you even begin to manage that process with the parties who were actually involved in the talks? Well, <clears throat> they sat three sides of a square, all the parties, in alphabetical order of the parties, not their names. Now, you might think that's a simple thing, which it is in the normal circumstances, but I'll give you one example, that um, Seamus Mallon, who was the deputy leader of the SDLP, the Nationalist Party, was, because of the alphabet, compelled to sit next to somebody representing one of the smaller loyalist parties, who had actually murdered his friend and had served 17 years in prison for the murder and reformed and came back. But you imagine having to do that day in, day out, sitting next to someone who'd actually killed your best friend, takes some doing. And you had to take up, you know, off your hat to, to all of them for doing that. They did go on a bit about history. And I, uh, I used to pay the gas bills by teaching history for a long time. And I told them that once after seven months of it, um, telling us what had happened in 11, whatever it was, 69. Um, 69, I said, look, isn't it time we actually moved on a little bit and decided to talk about the issues in front of us? But they needed 
that catharsis, if you like, in order to be able to talk to each other. And I remember one occasion, and I think Seamus Mann again and Jeffrey Robson from the other side were asked to reverse their positions. If you were a Republican, Jeffrey, what's your arguments on this? And if you were a Unionist, Seamus, what would you say about that? And they both did it extremely well. Um, but it was difficult to get them together and after Sinn Féin came in. DUP went out, of course. As soon as um, Sinn Féin came in, DUP walked out, but the others stayed. Um, and they stayed with some difficulty. And I was in the chair. And, for example, um, Jerry Adams would say, what does... Um, David Trimble, think about whatever it was. And I say, David, what do you think about uh, what he just said? And he then said to me, and then I had to say it to him, <laughs> and vice versa. And for four or five weeks, they had to go through me as the chair rather than talk directly to each other. But bit by bit, as the weeks went on, and they had to confront each other in smaller meetings rather than the plenary sessions and meet together with governments, and meet together in the canteen, bloody awful canteen it was too, in the bottom. <laughs> they would meet there and talk socially. And eventually, although we might not get them to shake each other's hands, although that eventually did come, before the Good Friday Agreement, there had been established, so far as we could, a rapport between the parties, which was essential. And if I can just, one second, uh, look at the present situation. The reason we're in the mess at the moment, there is no such rapport, I and mean, there is no such formal talk structure which they should have to try to do what we did 20 <coughs> years ago. So you think relationships were very important in Northern it's Irish critical. politics? I think they were key, but there's also a second part of this, is that the stature of the people that were involved. Ooh. I often was dealing with local councillors, <coughs> and actually that was often far more difficult. If there hadn't been from the leadership at the top of the political Absolutely. parties at the local level, it would never have happened. Mm. And I was always, because oh, yes, yes, I did so much yes, of the devolved yes. stuff, I was always far more uncomfortable dealing with some of the local politicians and local councillors than I was with dealing with the leaders of the parties. Mm. And it was just, they had the confidence of where they stood and the discussions they'd had with the government. That gave <coughs> them the confidence to move as they did, whereas local councillors were perhaps trying to prove something to somebody else in their party or another party. And I found the councillors' talks much more difficult than the leaders' talks. And Angela, of course, you did serve as minister for more devolved departments than anyone else, really. So you were oh. the real face of direct rule when the assembly wasn't functioning. Yeah. How did you run that day-to-day -day administration while simultaneously working towards getting the assembly up and running again? Uh, by the seat of your pants half the time, I think. You just had so many issues coming at you. And it, is, you know, it isn't rocket science, though. You just have to talk to people, and you had to be honest with people. If you try to sort of put something past somebody or you didn't understand your brief, um, or you, didn't, you, had to, and you had to care about the issues. I remember Jane Kennedy, who was education minister when I was health minister, coming in, a particular school um, where Betty Orr was the head teacher mm -hmm. on the Shankill. And she came in from this particular school. Now, all of us who've been involved in education will know that in any school, you're going to have children that have had some great trauma in their lives. We got the list from Betty, who I'm still in contact with, head teacher. And in every classroom, there were several children who had had a family member murdered or raped or <coughs> tortured or something in prison. In every class, there were several children. And the pressures that puts on the school so we really cared, and people knew we cared about it. Um, I think the only time I had a very, very difficult argument with somebody was when I came back. Um, a friend of mine was dying, and I'd left the hospital to get the flight back to Belfast um, for an education meeting the next morning. And Jerry Adams had the nerve to tell me it didn't really matter if I was there because he knew I didn't care because I wasn't from Northern Ireland. And I lost it. And it did him no harm whatsoever to see that I could lose it because I did care. And I resented so much being told that because I wasn't from Northern, I didn't care. I did. And after that, whenever he phoned, he'd say, and how's your friend doing? Because <laughs> that was always the first thing he ever said to me. Um, but it, I think we, they knew we cared about these things. So when we were doing the, on the devolved side, they knew we cared. But I think the other side of it as well was we were taking decisions that were very difficult for them to take. Um, just another quick anecdote. I remember some parents coming to see me for, about a school that we were proposing to close. It had one class for all the primary 
children for across three or four years, had one teacher and one head. They hadn't spoken to each other for a year. The results oh. were terrible, and the kids were having private tuition. And the teacher and two parents came in with the local elected representatives to ask me to keep the school open, the school shouldn't be closed. And they couldn't give me a justifiable reason why the school should stay open. It wasn't acting in the interest of the parents, it wasn't acting in the children or the staff. And so I had to say no. And I got a really hard time in the meeting from the elected politicians. Then the parents and teachers left and the politicians shook my hand and said, thanks very much, Minister. That's so much easier for you to do it than us. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> and that, yeah, Paul says that's the problem now because we had to take decisions and we would have to face things. Um, and a lot of the time the politicians were grateful that we were doomed and they would give us the information to help us make those decisions. So it, it was quite tricky at times. Yeah, yeah. And we'll come to your role as Victims Minister because I know that's mm. very important as well. Um, but just wrapping up the end of the agreement, Paul, I mean, how did you feel when, in, when the agreement was finally reached on the 10th of April 1998 and then endorsed later on in the two referendums in May? Um, the most memorable part of my life, without any shadow. There wasn't a dry eye in the room at 5.36 p.m. on April the 10th, 1998. It was unbelievable. It was remarkable. It was something six months before I would have said would never have happened. Because people were being killed by the, in the dozens only months before all this. It was an amazing, absolutely amazing, phenomenon that that could happen. But just to say that George Mitchell's last comment after he put the gavel on and said, meeting's over, it's not the end, it's the beginning. And it took a decade uh, for there to be a properly established assembly and executive, and it's taken two decades for that assembly and executive not to be running. And so he was absolutely right. But nevertheless, it had achieved something that nobody else had achieved. As John rightly said, it wasn't just us, we played our part. It wasn't just the Irish government, they played their important part too, but it was themselves who did it. And it is something that will live in my memory completely um, over the years. And the second question was on the... Uh, for the referendums. The referendum, they? of course. Um, a few weeks later, we, we had the referendum. There was enormous support for it right across the board. My job was to talk, amongst other things, to all the local newspaper editors. And remember, in Northern Ireland, each little town or village had two newspapers, one Catholic and one Protestant. And uh, you had to talk to all the editors. And with a few tiny exceptions, there was overwhelming support for this. I don't know what it was, 90 odd percent in the Republic, 75 or something percent in, 21 percent in, um, Northern Ireland, but the polling telling us that there was a majority in the Unionist community as well as in the Nationalist community in Northern Ireland. And I remember going into the big hall, I think it was the Horticulture Hall, I can't quite remember now, with Mo, just she and I, to announce the result, or to comment on the result. The result had been announced differently, but... And there were 500 journalists with their cameras and their television cameras in there. I had never, ever seen such a collection of journalists in my life before, and most unusually, they burst into applause. You don't get that very often um, from, from journalists who are very often sharp and a bit cynical. But the feeling there, and they were from all across the world, um, was such that this was really the beginning of a new era. And despite what's happened over the last two decades, it's something which the world hadn't seen for many, many, many decades, and I doubt we'll see again. So this brings us really nicely into the second part, which is the hard phase of trying to implement this agreement. And John, you took up the position of Secretary of State for Northern Ireland in 2001. How did this job compare to your previous cabinet posts? Oh, well, I think <laughs> we said it earlier, it's, it's the best. I had nine. Uh, we've shared a lot between us, and, and this is the best. Um, for lots of reasons. One, the magnitude, uh, the length of time this conflict can be going on. Uh, secondly, the characters, uh, fascinating from every side. Uh, 
thirdly, the crack, the conversation, the warmth. Um, not the I, drugs, John, just to make very No, <laughs> yes. For, for you young people, that's not drugs. Uh, it means the conversation and the culture and so on. But it is helped uh, by alcohol sometimes. It's, yeah, occasionally. Yeah. Occasionally. Yeah. Alcohol occasionally. Can, well, yeah. not, with, not with Dr Paisley, who regarded Guinness as, I think he called it the devil's buttermilk. buttermilk. So you mustn't, <laughs> you mustn't take that. And, and of course, on a lighter note, they give you a castle. <laughs> I mean, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, you get a castle. And I'd never had a castle before. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, this was, and, and you know, obviously it's actually the Queen's and she would come and stay the weekend and Charles would, and before you ask, Prince Andrew was nowhere near it, so. Uh, oh yes, he so, was with me once. Yeah. Well, yeah. ask, ask Paul what? to comment that. So, it, it is just a magnet. You know, if the Labour government under to Tony Germany. Blair had never done anything else except contribute towards the Irish peace process, it would have been worth having a Labour government just to do that because it was yeah, that so. important to us. And I will never forget the, the people that I met there. We disagreed with them. I mean, I, you, you were saying that you, you invited people, Paul, to put themselves in other people's position. I... Uh, I did that with Martin McGuinness at our first meeting, walking in the garden, because he preferred that to sitting in a room in Hillsborough Castle, which presumably he assumed was, was bugged. Um, uh, I'm not, I'll not tell you the conversation. I'll keep that for the book at some stage. But, but the, you know, you could begin to understand the, the chemistry of Northern Ireland. And the same chemistry need that led, I suppose, to the conflict, if it's turned in a different direction, could be the chemistry for the most marvellous culture in the world. I mean, the, you've got Yeats and Heaney, as well as Robert Burns, or, you know, you've, you've got the Irish playwrights as well as Shakespeare. You've got Irish dancing as well as um, uh, Scottish... Folk, you've got folk music, you know, the whole derivation of, of, of country and western land, bluegrass comes from Scottish, Irish music, as you will know as a fiddler uh, yourself. Um, but it was, and, and the contrast between them, I mean, I'll tell you an anecdote there as well, which concerns me. If I thought I had never come across her before, but actually I did, but I didn't know until this evening. And that was in the 50th anniversary of the Queen's reign, it was decided that each nation of the United Kingdom would be entitled to have one town raised to a city status. One in Scotland, one in Northern Ireland, one in Wales and one in England. And the week before the applications closed in Northern Ireland, my private secretary came in and said, Secretary of State, I've got some good news and some bad news for you. And I said, OK, give me them both. He said, well, the good news is we've got a new application to be raised to city status. And I said, what's the bad news? He said, it's Newry. <laughs> now, Newry was the capital of South Armagh. South Armagh was traditionally regarded as bandit territory with the Republican stronghold and so on. So you can see the problem it presented as Secretary of State. My God, everything in Northern Ireland was a zero-sum game. If you used the wrong name for Derry, if you said Derry rather than London Derry in certain quarters, you would have been, if you referred to the north of Ireland rather than Northern Ireland, if you, if you referred, incidentally, to the Good Friday Agreement, you know, the unionists would say, wait a minute, it's Belfast. the Belfast Agreement, not the Good Friday Agreement. So here I was having to pick one town and Newry's just applied. And I couldn't believe it. The anniversary of the Queen? Newry's applying for city status. Anyway, we did. Uh, so, in one of these ways that Secretary of State, Northern Ireland have to deal with things, I got in touch with the palace and said, we've got a wee problem. <laughs> Explained it. They said, what's the solution? I said, the solution is you give England a town and you give Scotland a town, you give Wales a town and you give us two. <laughs> right? <laughs> Which they did. So we made Lisbon a city <laughs> and we made Newry a city. Which brings me to Neve, because 
I went to the ceremony of city status in Lisbon. It was very formal. Everyone was there, the medals, band, and so on. And I read my little prepared speech. I then went <coughs> the following day to Newry. And as we approached it, despite the thick windows in my arm jag, I could hear this music. And I said to the civil servant, what's this? And they said, well, we believe there's some sort of fair going on. There were 20,000 people in the middle of Newry, right? No formal uh, parades, Irish show bands, Irish folk, Irish folk music from a bloody great platform, including a famous historian now, Neve, <laughs> who was playing the fiddle that day. And I turn up with this gear on and this thick speech. And there's a great platform, you know, and they're all dancing and singing. So as we walk out the back, I said to the civil servants, what the hell do you expect me to do? Oh, you've got to make a speech. <laughs> I said, are you kidding? So I get up as one of the bands is playing and I'm standing at the back like the roadie. And <laughs> just to warm everybody up, of course, there's a demo from Sinn Féin. <laughs> they're at the front of the audience howling oh, abuse at me. Um, so I get up to speak. And I thought, there's only one thing to do. So I said to the Shinners, look, everybody's here to enjoy themselves. Uh, so we can discuss this later, and I promise I'll meet you. Uh, and I got a wee bit of applause from the crowd. And then I said, I've got a speech here. Would you like the speech, or do you want me to give you a song? <laughs> and by speech, unanimity... <laughs> <laughs> There was, it was a song, no, I had a backing band on the stage, but the next problem was, what the hell do I sing? I can't sing, you know, no, you Kelly can't. the Boy from Talan or, you know, Grace or something like that. So I, I, I bottled out and sang Bobby McGee, uh, which is a country and western song of vaguely southern uh, extraction. Well, the point I make is the different cultures, even though they were both applying, you know, they celebrated in different ways. Um, and it made me feel a wee bit at home because my grandfather was a staunch Scottish Presbyterian. And my grandmother wa was a mad Irish Catholic Fenian. God knows how they survived all the years they did. But it was a bit like coming home when you go to Northern Ireland because you've got the staunch hard work ethic of the Protestants uh, there. And you've got the sort of let's live and have a bit of crack and, and a communal sense from, from the Catholics there. Sorry, I've talked too much. No, Does that ex answer your question? Uh, <laughs> I'm afraid I can't even remember my question, John. But it's <laughs> a whole point. But I will move to another one. I mean, that was a great day in Uri. I remember it very clearly. <coughs> one lot happened in Uri that was incredibly positive, so that was a very nice day. Yeah, I do remember so, well, that one. Maybe, that's, maybe instead of having a you know, one of these boring debates between the two so-called leaders. Um, <laughs> it'd be better to get them to give us a song, you know. <laughs> it certainly would be more popular. Well, that would be amazing. But um, as Secretary of State, what were some of the main challenges that you faced at that when time? When I arrived there? Yeah. Uh, and you had arrived there because at the very first press conference, um, there was probably half of the number of this audience and uh, I, I took a question from an English journalist, and being an English journalist and not really understanding, his question was, did you want this position, Secretary of State? As if you're going to say, no, I, you know, I just hate it. I, I don't want to do it. Uh, so I then took one from, I said, one from Northern Ireland. The very first question I got was, is it true you're a Celtic supporter? So I knew I had come into a situation where at least I was recognised. Um, the background music that you referred to earlier on, the background noise went on because the peace process is a process. It wasn't the event, as Paul said. And therefore, the UDA, uh, Ulster Defence uh, Association, were still killing people. Um, there was still a dispute about the Orange Lodge wanting to walk to Drum Cree, and that went every year. There was the terrible... Um, goings on at Holy Cross School where young children were shouted at and, and bullied and, and frightened going to school. So all of that was the norm. The priority, however, was to keep the institutions, that's the assembly, going. Why? Because 
the, Bel the Assembly in Belfast is key <coughs> to addressing the problems that have bedeviled the north of Ireland, Northern Ireland, I say, to please both sides of the community, for a long, long time. Um, it meant by devolving power to Belfast and a group of people who were drawn from the whole community under the <coughs> treaty, the agreement that Paul had worked out, um, that the nationalists and republicans didn't need to feel completely dominated by London and the unists didn't think there was a complete sellout to Dublin. So it was necessary to keep that going. That wasn't easy because the unionists distrusted Sinn Féin and the Republicans because the IRA had not yet de decommissioned, which I say a word about. Mm -hmm. And it was difficult for the Republicans because anyone who knows the history of the Republican movement, there were certain principles that had long been part of it. One of them was the armed struggle, but another one was abstentionism. Now, they had agreed to go into the Doyle in Southern Ireland uh, at a previous stage, but going into an institution that was part of what people would claim was the British structure was a very big deal for Republicans. And I understand that and understood it then. But from the unionist point of view, they had been in for several years and the IRA had been on ceasefire for about eight or nine years by the time I arrived there. Mm -hmm. And they had kept their word on that ceasefire in the sense that they didn't shoot British soldiers or policemen. But they were still targeting and training and recruiting. And because there was no policing in the Republican areas, because they wouldn't accept the RUC, and so we transformed it, then there was punishment beatings because they were administering their own justice. And therefore, you had a problem where to keep the institutions up, you had to keep the unionists in, but the unionists wouldn't stay in unless the IRA made some move on decommissioning. And decommissioning had been a precondition of the previous Tory government before talks, which is what killed it, because effectively the IRA were being asked to surrender in, in their eyes. Uh, so we, we accepted that it had to come as part of the political process. It was the outcome, if you like, rather than the precondition. Uh, nevertheless, it was a huge, huge measure. Um, and, you know, for Jerry Adams, Mark McGuinness, and, and the people who supported them and said, the Army Council and the volunteers of the IRA, this was a big, big deal. And eventually, we got a statement from Gerry Adams, which was sufficiently robust to allow me to reduce the troop numbers, reduce, take down some of the, the towers, uh, which were so offensive to Republicans in South Armagh and the border area and the area you come from, and, and we began gingerly to, to demilitarise, but that was to take a few more years and Paul would, would be involved in that um, after I, I left. So those were the two big priorities. Keep, you know, get movement on uh, reducing um, <coughs> the militarised situation and decommission and keep the assembly up. Of course, there were others. Um, which I'll only mention, policing, and then the legacy problems, particularly one regarding what's called the OTRs, the on the runs, uh, which was had been a promise to Sinn Féin, not in the agreement, but in the course of discussions. The Brits had promised the Shinners that they would solve the problem of those people who were not in jail, but had had to leave the country before being caught and investigated. And, and I'm happy to elaborate on that, okay, but we'll we, come, we yeah. did what we could, but it was, it was really difficult to resolve that one. Well, we'll come to that one. Thank you, John. Earlier on, we talked about the DUP, of course, who campaigned against the Good Friday Agreement, but eventually come into the fold and support the new Northern Ireland Assembly. Yeah. What changed <laughs> to bring the DUP in? What changed <laughs> that they said yes? Well, I'll give you it from the horse's mouth. Uh, when I later met Ian Paisley, 
uh, who was in the House of Lords, I said to him, you know, when I was a young man, I regarded you uh, <coughs> a major, major part of the troubles in Northern Ireland, Ian. How come you ended up being such a major part of the solution? Do you know what he said to me? I think you'd call it a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and that, that was his answer. Now, I mean, it's almost, it's, a miracle. it's almost like a miracle that somebody who'd been in there. Um, what brought Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams and a lot of others uh, to the conclusion that, they, they, that there's a political way? I think there's two things, right? It doesn't account for the DUP particularly, but conflicts like that, and it was a terrible conflict. I mean, if you called it a war, I wouldn't disagree with you. And it was probably a very dirty war, as most of these wars that are practically civil wars are. They only come to a conclusion when two things, well, three things. First is that both sides recognise they cannot win by violence. Secondly, that there is an alternative to violence, however difficult it is, in other words, a political solution. And thirdly, wise and courageous people on both sides of the conflict who recognise that that road, however difficult, has to be taken. It takes people a long time to get there because they have to carry people behind them. So, for instance, if, if you were negotiating with Pyra, with, with Jerry or Martin or whoever, who were tough negotiators, by the way, um, it's a well-known phenomenon with trade unions that they push the boss to give them as much as possible, and then when it's finished, they say, look, I could accept this, but the boy's out there. I can't sell it to them, you know, so you'll have to give me that bit more, right? So, you know, when, when, when Sinn Féin said that, you then had to make a decision. Is just a, this a tactic to get more? Or is it a real strategic problem because the volunteers won't come? Why did you have to make that? Because the whole history of the IRA is a history of splits. And the one thing I think that would have been in nobody's favour is if the IRA had split in a major way, in a major way, of course it did. It split in 1985, I think, and it split again at the time of the Good Friday Agreement. But so, so there was a substance behind the claim. You have to give us more time. We have to consult the volunteers. We have to carry it on. Now, with Paisley, it was the same thing, uh, although, you know, it wasn't with the volunteers. But two people sacrificed their parties, actually, in order to get this agreement going. One was John Hume and the SDLP, who must never be forgotten. And the other one was David Trimble. I mean, David and I probably didn't, wouldn't have gone for a pint together, as they say, in Northern Ireland. But he showed great courage and great leadership. And the UUP suffered badly. Um, and on the one side, Sinn Féin, captured a lot of the SLD, SDLP votes, and on the other side, the DUP captured them. So for a period, they played the hardliners, mm -hmm. whose default position was, no, never, never, never. Um, but then eventually, I think Paisley and the DUP recognised the reality. They'd voted against this. Uh, they didn't support the Good Friday Agreement. But then I think they became persuaded that the IRA meant what they said. Uh, and at that stage, I think they were left with no alternative because the people of Northern Ireland wanted the agreement to work. That, that's the best I can work it out. And of course, they entered that power sharing executive in 2007. Angela, I mean, we have that very uh, significant photograph of Paisley beside Martin McGuinness laughing, right? Nickney and the Chuckle Brothers, yeah? yeah? How important were symbolic moments like that for the politics of Northern Ireland? I think they were crucial, but it also, I think in both those cases, you had two men who had another side of them that most people had never seen. Um, 
John's already mentioned, you know, um, in Paisley's humour, he caught me in a pub once with a pint of Guinness, and did I suffer for it? Um, but in a humorous, jokey way, he was teasing. Probably did you win in a pub? I was down in, um, oh, what's Can't the name? I mean. Where the yeah. Bushmills. I was down Bushmills. in the Bushmills, Bushmills yeah. Um, and another time, I was at, um, when the new Lyric Theatre opened, I was there for the, I'd gone back for the opening, and Martin McGuinness was there, and he had a poem that he'd written that he was reading out and went mm. very red, as gingerhead people do, when he read it. Now, that's a side of most of them that their own people would have seen, but the other side never saw. Mm. And I think it, their personalities made that possible. And it's, you know, you try to imagine if it had been other people later. Would it have happened in the way it did, how it did? I don't know. I think you had two quite special people um, that made it happen, and they trusted us. Well, they had street cred with their own people. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, Paisley, you can think, and I'm not going to argue with you that this was a bigot who contributed so much, and Martin McGuinness here was an IRA commander who must have been a cold-blooded commander and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but when they came to make <coughs> a compromise, they carried... They were best placed to carry their people with them. Not easily. Not easily. These, these were big moves that were being made by both sides. Mm -hmm. But the same way that Nixon Went could do a deal with China but you in America, whereas if John F. Kennedy had tried it, it would be called a communist. But, John, I think you're underestimating your role and Paul's role, because I think that there was also the element they trusted um, you both. And I think if there hadn't been that trust in us and in the Irish government at that time, it wouldn't have happened. So I think a lot of things came together with the right people in the right places. Great. OK, let's come back to that issue of trust. It's a very important one. Um, John, just now, briefly, uh, of course, devolution of policing was a big issue, right, whenever you were Secretary of State. Why was it, and the issue of, the, of justice as well, why were they such difficult issues to resolve? Whatever you look at this type of conflict in the world, I think you'll find that the last thing to be resolved is policing. Mm. I mean, if you take the terrible case of Bosnia, um, in Bosnia, the Serbs and the Croats and the Bosniaks, the Muslims, had actually formed an army with regiments in it of Croats and so on before they formed a joint police service because the police are the guys nearest you at the end of the street with a gun. And in Northern Ireland, the police had been perceived, and I understand that perception, for many years as the custodians of the Protestant heritage of Northern Ireland. They were a Protestant police for a Protestant nation, uh, was the sort of view of it. And therefore, to get through into a new policing from the RUC, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, to the police service Northern Ireland, following the, 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 the blueprint that Chris Patton, who had been commissioned to do, to get from where we were in the RUC to the PSNI was a really difficult problem in human terms. Yes, you could change the uniforms. Yes, you could write various things um, in, into their constitution, but the Republicans and Nationalists did not trust the police and therefore it was really difficult to get them to participate in the new democratic structures controlling the police. And the Ulster Unionists and Loyalist people thought it was a betrayal of the RUC, so many of whom had died during the previous 30 years. So even getting a police board up was really difficult. Um, we, the UUP, the Ulster Unionists, David Trimble, joined it. But I had great difficulty in, in getting the SDLP on it. I eventually did. <coughs> or, or Paul, I think you maybe got the SDLP. But amazingly, I got Paisley to join it. Paisley didn't want to join it, didn't want to be in with nationalists, and you're letting all these terrorists join it and so on was his view. But eventually we did, with the simple expedient of giving them more places on it than the UUP had on it. Uh, because remember, there was great rivalry between the DUP and the UUP as well. So it wasn't just between the communities. Um, but it, it will take a long, long time. I mean, basically we had to have some sort of community people, uh, uh, community policing, where to the horror of many on the unionist side, 
many people who would be involved in the local policing, overseeing it, would be people who'd been IRA volunteers or served in prison. But at the end of the day, if you want to end a conflict, you've got to agree with your enemy <laughs> on how to do it. There's no good trying to end a conflict where you say, no, well, you know, you, you've got no participation in this. <laughs> So, is well, that... Yeah, absolutely. Well, on that note, Angela, of course, you were a victims minister from May 2003 until May 2006, mm -hmm. yeah? And, of course, one of the ongoing challenges today has been the perceived lack of justice for families and relatives who were killed and maimed in the conflict. Has the Good Friday Agreement failed these people? I don't think so, no. But I think what, as um, everyone said, it was the start of something. It was never going to be the end of anything. Yeah. And the expectations of victims and the needs of victims and survivors were just so vast that it's, it's one of those most difficult issues to address. It was probably the hardest part of the work that I did um, because on all the other, on all the devolved areas, you'd have a policy, a decision, and whether people liked it or not, you'd make a decision, you'd move forward. Um, but on this one, um, I went out on a sort of consultation tour um, Went, I think went to every county and had meetings. It was only afterwards I realised probably how um, naive I was and my officials were of just putting me at the front of meetings, talking on my own and taking views from people. And I had a couple of unpleasant incidents where people were so distressed and upset. Um, on one occasion I was going to a meeting um, at the... I think it was at the Odyssey. It was a big event that was being held, not just victims, it was just a whole kind of issues. And I get a message from some of the um, women that were inside the meeting telling me that Sinn Féin had a demonstration outside and I wasn't going to be allowed in. So I'm in the car and uh, my officials and my husband was supposed to be with me at that time, and the cops say, you can't go in, you've got to go around the back, we'll take you in the back entrance. And I said, I'm not prepared to go around the back, I'm going to go in the front door. But you can't, you mustn't, you, no, I'm going to the front door. So they phoned ahead and another car turns up and all this. And I walk in, there's this demonstration outside of me going to the meeting with members of Sinn Féin holding placards, about 20 or so of them. Michael, somebody who was one of the councillors, I can't remember his surname now. Uh, no, no, one of the Sinn Féin councillors. It was always very difficult. And so I go in and I get out of the car and they're standing there. And there's, um, I say, hello, nice to see you. And I walked up and shook his hand. <laughs> And the look of horror on his face, I'd called him out, and he couldn't not, because it was the thing about being a woman, he said about Mo. Um, they weren't so used to women ministers, and I, I think I was only the third woman minister they'd been in North Island. So, fourth. <laughs> so I shook his hand. Next thing I know, all the women councillors want selfies with me that they can see. <laughs> so it was trying to sort of get under people and, and hear, but the stories you heard, and it was easier to understand why it was so difficult to bring people together <coughs> when you hear the personal tales of suffering, um, what they've been through. Everybody had something where somebody in their family had been killed or maimed, um, and you can't meet all those objectives. One uh, man came to see me and went out to the press attacking me afterwards because what really disturbed him is his father had been killed on a bus. There'd been a bomb on a bus, his father had been killed. That photograph has been around the world in lots of books and in newspapers. He wanted me to stop that photograph ever being published again, and I couldn't deliver that for him. Um, so what we tried to focus was on things, that were coming back on the consultation, good mental health services, good physical health services, because the, the health legacy of the troubles is enormous for Northern Ireland, um, and you notice that. Um, but others wanted the recognition. They wanted a memorial. Um, they wanted somewhere to go and think about their families that they'd lost. Others wanted a more political statement. And one of the things when I was there, we were getting, the Bloody Sunday inquiry was ongoing, which was hugely expensive. And I remember with Paul, we gave evidence to a House of Commons select committee. And one of the contrasts they drew up was, hang on, you've got a £20 million budget for services for victims, yet you're spending hundreds of millions on the Bloody Sunday inquiry. Um, but if you look at the outcome of that, the Im political impact of the Bloody Sunday inquiry was massive. Um, but it, so there was this contrast between what are the political implications and what are the services we need. So it was probably the trickiest part of the work I had the whole time I was there. And we'll, we'll never fully deliver on that because you can't ever raise the, the hurts. You can't, you can just hope that you're making it different in the future 
And that's where I think the difference you can make to victims and survivors, that that scale of misery that was caused during the Troubles isn't there now. Yeah, yeah. And if we fail to sort of deliver and fully implement you know, and get the assembly up and running again, then I think that's when we will have failed people. Yeah. Of course, you've mentioned the, the military services. And um, I mean, there is a question of how justice can be applied to military personnel who served in Northern Ireland, not in the direct actions they took per se, mm -hmm. but in how they oversaw and even facilitated the actions of paramilitaries that carried out horrific attacks. Mm -hmm. I mean, should these people be brought before the courts? Well, I certainly, I mean, when I was there in 2001 or thereabouts, this wasn't, it was an issue, but it wasn't such a public issue as it's become now what, you know, the books by Martin Ingram and Willie Carlin and any number of other people, the idea of collusion. In a sense, where the military does something uh, publicly, uh, which is very wrong, like Bloody Sunday, um, it's easier to deal with. And by the time I became Secretary of State, we'd already established the, the, the Bloody Sunday Inquiry. Where the area becomes much more difficult to deal with, though uh, we started off inquiries into four cases, which I can mention, um, is in a conflict of this nature, uh, then, First of all, by its very nature, intelligence, uh, well, I think the first thing is that, that, that both sides are not equal because one side, i.e. the state, has the numbers, the money, the machinery, the military, and so on. The other side, that is, let's call it a neutral word, the insurgent, um, doesn't have that. But on the other hand, the state has an obligation under international law its domestic law and its moral precepts to abide by certain rules that the insurgent doesn't. I mean, I doubt, I don't know, not having been in it, but I doubt the IRA had a lot of discussion about whether or not they were breaching the European Convention on Human Rights or, or uh, you know, the international protocols of the Geneva Convention. The state has to do that. And I'm not complaining about that, I'm saying that's a reality. Because the second thing is, in this type of conflict, intelligence is absolutely essential. And part of intelligence, apart from technology and eavesdropping and so on, part of intelligence is human intelligence. So you obviously need people inside these insurgent organisations. The problem is, of course, where is the line where you're supporting an agent inside an organisation like this who has to retain their position by breaking the law. And has that line been crossed? Yeah? Now, that line has obviously been crossed. And I don't think you can solve that by the state saying, we're not going to recognise the European Convention of Human Rights or... You know, we, we'll, we'll only, it'll only matter for the last 10 years, not before that. I don't think you, you know, the, the state, in my view, the British state can't, can't do that. So one of the legacy issues that I mentioned other than the on the runs, and it rose out the on the runs, <laughs> is how do you solve this problem if you don't draw a line? And the promise has been made to Sinn Féin that those who were outside the country um, would be able to return and the problem would be resolved. Except nobody had a way of resolving it. And I didn't know anything about it until I arrived there and the briefing they told me, by the way, you've got this problem. The only way to do it would have been back then by drawing a line in the sand in 1998 and saying anything before that didn't count. However, it's quite clear you can't just do that to one side. Because if you do it to one side, particularly if, if you were do, only doing it to the, the IRA or you know, the lawyers paramilitaries, it would never got through the House of Commons or, or any normal forum. It would have been amended to include all sides. But you try and get, certainly in 2001, everybody 
to agree that the other side should be let off, right? Because the Republicans obviously weren't going to do it as far as the RUC and the British Army was concerned. And, you know, the, the British weren't be keen on it if it was, as I said, if it was just uh, drawing a line for the IRA. So, I mean, I tried every possible way of doing it. Eventually, actually during Peter Haynes' time, about 2006, six seven, eventually there was some sort of indication from the Republicans that if this what was necessary to get their guys back, they wouldn't support it, but there was nothing they could do <coughs> to bring it in. The problem then is that the nationalists, that is the SDLP who'd never used violence, got wind of it and started to say, ah, Jerry Adams is only willing to tolerate this to get his cronies off. So the Republicans, whatever interest they had in it, they, they had to back off, and I understand that. Meanwhile, the unionists have always... So here is an irresoluble problem, which I do not believe can be done by a one-sided set of rules. And maybe that's <coughs> the way the government is going down at the moment. They are saying it's terrible. You know, we, we will derogate from the European Convention that... that you know, it won't apply to us. Well, I don't see how, uh, in the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement and making the thing sustainable, you can actually do it unless it's a set of values and rules that apply to everyone. Okay, yep, thank you. So I'm going to move to the last three questions before we open up uh, the floor to, to everybody else. Um, Paul, of course, neither the, the executive or assembly is sitting today in Northern Ireland, having been suspended for almost three years now. What advice would you give to our current crop of politicians today? You mean local politicians or Westminster ones? Both, please, Both. now you yeah. mention it. Well, I think the problem we've got at the moment is that <clears throat> we haven't got that trust we were just talking about, mm -hmm. um, resulting largely for the heating scheme initiative, which went very badly wrong. And the Simply Trust completely collapsed uh, between the two sides, between the DUP and Sinn Féin. And so we've got a situation where we've got the longest running absence of any legislature in the world. Three years, and there's no government in Northern Ireland. There's no direct rule from us. And so therefore, civil servants, basically, are running the show. Nothing wrong with civil servants, but they're not paid to run the show. They're paid to advise politicians to do it. And so I think a number of things could happen. First of all, there's got to be whoever wins this election has to turn their attention much more succinctly and powerfully to resolve within a month, incidentally, because the law currently stands that unless they can resolve the re-establishment of the Assembly and the Executive by the end of January, there's going to be elections for the Northern Ireland Assembly, which may or more likely may not make any difference. So there's four weeks when they come back after Christmas to try and resolve it. I said to you before about the significance of prime ministerial involvement. John Major had a huge influence yeah. um, in terms of his own personal involvement in trying to bring about peace in Northern Ireland. Tony Blair did. But I don't think we've seen that over the last... I'm not making this as a party point. I'm simply making it as a practical point that there have been a few days where prime ministers have flown into Belfast and flown back out again. Mm -hmm. And you can't do it. You can't make peace part-time. It's got to be a full-time initiative. And it's got to be a proper structure. Remember when we made those um, agreements 20 years ago, People had actually been elected in Northern Ireland to become negotiators. And when they had done, it was a full-time job. For two or three years, they lived that in a building, awful bloody building, in Belfast. They lived there. Mm -hmm. And the talk structure was so sophisticated that in a, in, in a way, the process of the talks helped to make them successful. Now, that's not happening. Mm -hmm. There's and no genuineness about it. Sure. And th there should be, as well as the structures, they should have somebody like George Mitchell. Absolutely. They should have a, a chair or a, whatever you want to call them, a mediator of great standing.
from another country who can go there and act as the referee. Can't we sort that out? Pardon? Can we not sort that out? Well, well we, we have to the parties. <laughs> yeah, then it's but the government's Paul, up Paul's to do that. Paul's absolutely yeah. right. When you look at all the thorny issues, um, I mean, decommissioning, we brought in John de Chastelin, um, and various others who Cyril were not... Cyril Ramaphosa for the um, yeah. decommissioning? Cyril, yeah. Um, oh, they, I know the ANC were quite close to uh, the IRA as regards, you know, the, the process. In fact, this may come as a surprise to you, but many former members of the IRA have also played a role in trying to bring about conflict resolution in areas of the world where it appears um, desperately impossible to do so. They, they have gone there, people from the Unionist and Loyalist side and people who, who were ex-IRA. Um, the, the Chris Patton, um, Bill Clinton, George Mitchell. Um, so the parties themselves, however, have got to want to reach a resolution and to bring in, you know, uh, an external mediator. And they need to have better leadership can, can, too. Yeah, I, don't think, I don't think it can be done at Westminster, can but it? No, but it does need a Westminster, a greater Westminster involvement. And if you look, oh, yes. if you look at some under the Labour government, it was the big hitters, Mo, Peter Mandelson, um, John and Paul. It was, a, it was a big job. And there's a danger, I think, when the coalition government came in that they thought Northern Ireland had been resolved. Oh. They thought it had been dealt with. It wasn't a problem anymore. And no one anticipated the RHI scandal that cropped up and caused. There's a new book about it at the moment. Yeah, just reading yeah. it. Um, no one anticipated that. And I've spoken to successive secretaries of state and said, you have to understand there has to be ongoing political engagement with all the parties. You can't just say, here's a room, have a meeting. You have to have the meetings beforehand. You have to have meetings before the meetings before the meeting. Um, and so I've been very critical. And I have to say, I think the Lords Minister, Ian Duncan, I'd put him as Secretary of State and say, right, you're in charge, you run this, because I think he gets it. Um, but trying to get the level of engagement um, that we had back, I think, is really important, because it well, wasn't it, it helps. I think it, you've been far too kind, Angela. I mean, it helps if... <laughs> it helps... Well, it doesn't help if you've got a Secretary of State who says... I've just arrived here. I didn't know people in Northern Ireland voted along uh, sectarian uh, or, or uh, community lines. I mean, where have you been all your political but, life if you don't know that? I'll give you a more practical example. When the National Crime Agency was set up, um, the Home Office were dealing with it, and I happened to be the Home Office Shadow Minister in the House of Lords at the time. And I've said, have you spoken to the NIO about this? Because there's implications for Northern Ireland around policing. And I said, oh, don't mention that, don't mention. Why? Well, they might not have noticed. That's why well, I think you need to talk to the NIO and who they're talking to. Well, we haven't... I said, who's talking to Sinn Féin? Who's talking to the SDLP? So then we had a briefing with the Northern Ireland um, Secretary of State around a range of issues. And I said, what's happening about this? They said, oh, no, that's been dealt with by the Home Office. OK. So I went back to the Home Office, and it was just coincidental that the three people dealing with it in, on the Labour side, well, I was dealing with it in the House of Lords Home Office for Northern Ireland, and it was um, David Hanson, who'd been a Northern Ireland minister, was now Shadow Policing, and Vernon Coker, who policing minister, was in doing Northern Ireland. So there were three of us involved on the Labour side who'd had involvement in both those departments. So we asked that the NIO said it was being dealt with by the Home Office. The Home Office said, no, the NIO was dealing with that. And it just fell between, so suddenly you've got a crisis, the National Crime Agency being set up, because nobody was having the political engagement ongoing to deal, to stop those kind of problems occurring. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think we are now, and that's why I'm not terribly optimistic, and why we have to get some, a big name in from outside the UK who will want to engage with us and actually have the credibility in Northern Ireland or with Northern Ireland politicians to move things along. Otherwise, we're going to chunter <laughs> along like this and it's just going to get worse and it's going to be harder and harder and to be Brexit established. And Brexit has done it. Yeah. Yeah. Brexit has so overwhelmed everything, completely overwhelmed, whatever your views on it. The fact that it's overwhelmed politics in both Ireland and in uh, the United Kingdom, because Ireland will be most affected of any country outside ourselves, that has meant that there's been no proper attention. And when we've talked about earlier on what we resolved in 1998, resolved 
prisoners coming out. We resolved the issue of policing, criminal justice, how to set up an, a new parliament and executive, all these huge issues resolved. What's stopping them doing it now? The Irish language. There's nothing wrong with the Irish language. Uh, my <laughs> great-grandparents spoke it. Um, and we've got a Welsh language uh, act in Wales which brings in a bilingual country. Well, all those things. Paul, can I jump in and say, I mean, how damaging do the three of you think Brexit has actually been to the work that you've done, the peace process itself? Well, well just quickly to follow in from and the, Paul. Uh, the, just to say about the language was that, <laughs> get, bear in mind the issues you have to discuss now, which is stopping an assembly executive compared we did two decades ago. It's ludicrous. And we can resolve those issues, but it's back to trust or the lack of it at the end of the day. What I can't understand, there may be an explanation that's beyond me, because I'm not the brightest, but why is it that if you want to be British, you want to be, as an absolute principle, that you're British in everything except when you don't want to be? So on abortion, no, we don't want British laws. On gay marriage, we don't want British laws. On the language, yeah, OK, the Welsh have got their signs in Welsh and the Scots have got them. But we don't want them. You know, I mean, I, I, for that to bring down the Assembly for three years, to me, is, to put it mildly, disproportionate. As regards Brexit, the, over, the overall strategic position under Boris Johnson's plan will be that Northern Ireland will do quite well out of it in this sense uh, of the economy. Because effectively, Northern Ireland's staying inside the European Union, isn't it? It's staying and the Scots inside. and the Welsh will love it. Yeah, the Scots will go mad. Um, but, I mean, if, if I was a shinner, and I haven't been asked yet to be one, but if I was, then I would think that Boris Johnson's deal is quite a good deal. Yeah. The problem, however, in the subtext, is that part of his deal also unravels the Good Friday Agreement. Because the part that unravels the Good Friday Agreement is the part that in the agreement which says that, look, when a decision is taken, then every, both communities must have a majority for it. And apparently he's unilaterally abandoned that and said, you know, as regards to the future in Northern Ireland, it will be a majority vote. Well, that may or may not be a good thing, but it's not the Good Friday Agreement. So very that briefly, yeah, for the three of you then, and we're going to close with this, will the agreement last another 20 years? Uh, well, there was provision in the agreement for it to be reviewed every so often. You know, obviously what you're doing two decades ago <laughs> could be different from now, but the basis of it... I think will survive, but it's under terrible strain at the moment. Yeah. Angela? I think it's for the most difficult time for it, and it comes down to this lack of political engagement at the moment. I think Brexit is hugely damaging. The, there's one party in Northern Ireland that supports Brexit, and they're the ones actually with, in government, and if or have been until very recently, um, <coughs> propping up the government. And so the divisions that's caused in Northern Ireland, political divisions are huge. Um, so unless there is some very serious political engagement starting straight away at local, at national and at international level, then I'd think it's the stress. I hope it, is not, it doesn't break it, but I fear that the stress could be um, hugely damaging and it will take a generation to get us back to where we should be. Yeah, yeah. And John, final word on that? The, the, the principles underlying the Good Friday Agreement are the only solution on the island of Ireland. The relationship between Dublin, Belfast and London, the involvement of both communities and all communities in Northern Ireland in decision taking. There is no alternative route to go. Right? I mean, the only alternative is to go back to you know, the, the one party state we had previously. That is unsustainable, it's unacceptable. I believe it's unacceptable to a British government, far less the people of Northern Ireland. So whether or not the mechanics can, it can sustain, you know, the, the, the three years without an assembly or whatever, but, but there is no other way to go for the, the goodness, uh, for, for the, the, the future of the people of Northern Ireland. 
of the whole island of Ireland, and I would argue for the whole of the United Kingdom. But I fear greatly that this particular deal of Boris Johnson's will threaten, will not restore the sovereignty of the United Kingdom, but in the long run, I believe will be a great threat to the unity of the United Kingdom, yeah. Scotland and Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. But who am I to tell somebody as bright as Boris Johnson? Right. <laughs> well, I think that seems like a perfect note in which to finish. Uh, I'd like to really thank my panellists this evening for it's been a really stimulating talk and for sharing your experiences with us. So thank you very much for coming here tonight. Thank you. So we're also, we're going to open the floor to questions. I'm going to let you talk as well, but... Um... The panellists have, al have allowed you to speak. So there's, you... there's not a lot of time for this, but uh, so Neve joins this panel now. If people need to leave, then if you go now. But I mean, if anybody has any questions, I hate to say this to you from what you've just witnessed, but please be brief. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you first. Go on. I'm a third year politics student um, here, and I, the first time I formally learned about Irish history was at university from Mr. Bork and Neve as well. Um, so thank you to them. But if you were redesigning the curriculum that was taught to students, what one lesson would you want students to know about Irish history and the peace process? Okay, so as we move this microphone to somebody else, mm -hmm. um, okay, in a sentence, would you like pen? what one lesson would you ensure was in the curriculum? Any other questions? One lesson. Yeah. Go on, panellists. Oh, right. On the lesson... It's, it's involved in history inevitably, and it started, and short of um, having total integrated education there, they sh each community should learn about each other, and that's beginning to happen. And so there should be uh, part of the curriculum which is entirely devoted to conflict resolution, working with each other, and understanding the other side of the story. It's happening, but it could be more sophisticated than it is at the moment. OK. So post-Brexit, that might be good for us too, mind you. Well, uh, I would have one simple lesson, and, and, and that is on democracy is not the dictatorship of the majority over the minority, that it is a majority which respects the rights of the minority. And if, you don't, and if you don't have that, then you don't have a functioning democracy, and that surely, and I take it you're talking about as regards Northern Ireland, yeah. then it's not sustainable, it won't work if you only have the rule of one group okay. without regard to the rights of the minority. So, Angel? Yeah, I think for me it'd be history, because I grew up, as a, you know, and I would see in my papers every day what was happening in Northern Ireland. Now, today is the anniversary of the bomb in Birmingham, and I was in Birmingham earlier today. Um, and so I grew up with that. And so as we've moved forward to look at the Good Friday Agreement, that makes sense to me. But I think now children in schools now would have no idea of that history. So I think it's important that I'd like to say more about the history of Ireland, the history of the British Isles as a whole. So perhaps we need to re-look re at the curriculum so people understand the political decisions that are being made now have their roots in the history of what's happened previously. OK, Eve. so you're still in education. And of all of us, you're nearest to having... You wouldn't when they'll remember <laughs> what school was like better than any of us. So what would you well, put I, into I, the school curriculum? I would agree with Angela. I think history is really important. Um, and I've been generally disappointed with how much history people know about Northern Ireland within the field of British history, but also from Northern Ireland as well. Uh, people have a very poor understanding of their past, very recent past. It is difficult to teach, absolutely. And meanings, people have very different meanings about what happened in the last 30, 40 years. But it is crucial. It's crucial to integrate that into was, our curriculums. I was in my 30s and I went to the Republic. I'd never heard of Michael Collins before then. And I think that's pretty shocking, given the impact that has had on the history of you know, the British Isles altogether. So, uh, yeah, it's got to be about history. So this gentleman here who has a microphone, and then I'll, we'll pass it forward to you, sir. Uh, good evening. Thank you for, for a very insightful talk. Uh, I'm too. coming from the Balkans, so I was very uh, interested to hear how was this process uh, going on uh, in Northern Ireland. 
Uh, and seeing that the referendums were held with a large number of uh, out uh, people voting, and uh, effectively they were supportive of the referendum in both uh, both sides of uh, the island. Uh, what was the message that was conveyed to the people to incentivize them to uh, effectively vote for the agreements? Okay. Well, I, I suppose we got oh. it there. Can we do the agreements? Yeah, sure. There's a slogan in there, isn't there? Yeah. Um, it's your decision. It's about your feature. Please read it carefully. I actually chose the photograph for that because I thought it really did symbolize the future rather than the past. And in the referendum, I think above all else, and remember they were voting on a very complicated agreement. It wasn't just a yes, no, because they knew what they were voting on, and particularly very difficult issues. Release of prisoners was the most difficult one for both sides. Very hard for them to, but they did in the end because of the long-term goal, the big picture, and the big picture was there to be no more violence there. And, um, but it, was, it had all been preceded by the most sophisticated peace process that probably Europe has ever seen. Okay, so... so a very short answer. Yeah. It was about the future, and I think yeah. a lot of the posters at the time said moving forward, look future. to the future, um, rather than trying to move away from the history of it. Yeah. So, so I'm going to ask this man in a white shirt to ask the next question, and then the microphone will pass to this gentleman in a white shirt. That will then be three men and one woman who's asked the question. So nobody else is asking. No mother man is asking a question until two women do so. Okay, please. Uh, okay. Um, well, notwithstanding the um, transformative effect that the um, change in policy on um, decommissioning had when the Labour Party entered government in 1997, I think that was indeed seismic, but um, I suppose in the interest of uh, bipartisanship, it is worth saying how much of the agreement was in place before Labour came to power. Peter Brooks, no selfish strategic interest statement, had a huge effect on the IRA. Um, the Hume Adams talks were transformative within Sinn Féin. The 1993 Downing Street Declaration indicated north-south consent mechanisms and therefore the final referendum. So. Um, Obviously, I pay tribute to the um, seismic efforts of the panel, but there was a prehistory which, so it's a point really about bipartisanship and that's disappeared. So yeah. that's also something worth recovering. Yeah. I, I agree entirely to... with you. Incidentally, it hasn't disappeared. I mean, it may be that, that in trying to, you won't have thought our answers were short, but in trying to keep them at least reasonably concise, we've missed that out, <coughs> but let me, Entirely agree with you. I think John Major showed a lot of uh, courage in maintaining contacts behind the scenes, even with the bomb at Canary Wharf. I think the statement that Britain has no um, selfish strategic or economic interest in Northern Ireland, which was designed by Gerry Adams and John Hume, uh, was absolutely essential as well. And lots of other contacts of... of apparently no great significance. I remember meeting Mitchell McLaughlin oh, years ago at a Labour Party conference um, and, and others, you know, so th th you're absolutely right. Nothing is, is, is new. Um, and people in, in Sinn Féin were doing it as well. I mean, Martin McGuinness was obviously talking to people. We know about the public in, in 1972 when... when uh, Jerry was uh, let out of uh, Long Cash and they flew to London and so on. But there was all sorts of um, contacts through intermediaries going on, just the same way as there was in South Africa. So I yeah. absolutely agree with you. Okay, Paul. It's, it's, it's about complacency. <coughs> Is that at the time that the Conservatives were doing rightly what they did and what we did in succession, everything was immediate, everything was important. People have taken it for granted. People are now in their 40s who were the first people to understand what had happened. People under 40 can't remember this other than history. And because we've had 20 years of peace in Northern Ireland, that immediacy has gone. And that, I fear, has affected government as well, is that governments have become complacent and they don't realise that you have to keep on at this thing to make it work. OK, so the gentleman with the white and then this lady here. OK. Uh, hello, thank you for the great talk. Um, uh, my name is Dermot. Uh, I should start by kneeling my colours to the mast and saying that I'm, I'm an Irish Catholic from North Belfast. And I'm a, a history PhD here at, uh, at St. Catherine's College, although American history, uh, not Irish history. 
So I probably know a little bit more about Clinton and Mitchell than uh, Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness. In fact, actually, just briefly, um, I was at the Nixon Presidential Library last year, and I looked at the, some of the notes of a meeting that Nixon and Kissinger had had with Ted Heath in 1971. And Nixon and Kissinger, as a side, after the end of this conversation, say to each other, look, there's all, these, there's all this stuff happening in Northern Ireland, you know, but what, should, should we say anything to Ted Heath about it? Should we do something? And uh, Kissinger says, no, it's, it's nothing to worry about, Mr. President. <laughs> and, uh, and Nixon says, good, I think it's a domestic problem. So obviously a long way from Bill Clinton um, later in the 1990s. But I should just say uh, briefly that my, uh, my grandfather uh, was, was killed by the provisional IRA in 11th of November, 1971. He was actually the first Catholic uh, RUC member uh, killed in the Troubles. Um, and the question I have to ask is, going into your roles, how familiar were you with the um, previous uh, negotiations, negotiating positions by um, conservative governments mostly, um, secret negotiations that had taken place since the early 1970s? involving people like Martin McGuinness going to London in 1972, for instance. Because I'm quite curious as to how similar, uh, for how long was were the terms that ended up being the 1998 Good Friday Agreement on the table going right back to the early 1970s? Um, was there any moments before 1998 where yeah, it looked like there I was think a confluence we've got the point, of factors? Yeah. Sorry. Well, the Please. Issues, the, issues, um, the issues were the same, of course. In the immediate years preceding the Good Friday Agreement. So we know what the big issues were. What we couldn't do, because no government can do it, is to be told precisely what earlier governments had done, because that's not constitutionally proper. But we knew the elements of it. And on a personal note, for example, my immediate process, uh, predecessor was Michael Ancrum. He was the Minister for Political Development. And I couldn't have had someone more helpful as a Conservative coming to me and explaining a lot of the, what had gone on under his tenure in that office. Um, but I think that ultimately, and obviously with the Irish government as well, we knew the issue. We didn't necessarily know all the detail. Uh, but, we, but it was generally, in those days, non-partisan. Not quite so convinced. Quite so convinced. We've arrived at that at the moment. OK. Right, so this lady here and then the lady up there. OK, please. Um, it's just a general question um, about official memory, I suppose, or memory within political parties and within um, civil service elites, perhaps. <laughs> so it kind of relates to the last question. On the Irish side, <coughs> if you talk to senior civil servants, they talk about, you know, Sunningdale, uh, um, right up to the Good Friday Agreement, all as part of a continuum, OK? Am I correct in thinking that on the British side, there's far more discontinuity, lack of institutional memory, except perhaps in the security forces, in wave after wave of dealing with Ireland? So it's, it's a broader question also about Anglo-Irish relations, because over this whole period of Brexit, it appears to be the case that not merely is Northern Ireland in a state of suspension, but that contacts and connections between the British and Irish government have lapsed, and presumably that too is another reason uh, for the dreadful state of politics in Northern Ireland at the moment. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. And just on the history point, just one minor issue, I suppose from an Irish point of view, what the Brexit debate here, I suppose, revealed was, you made that comment, um, Angela, about um, never having heard of Michael Collins, but it's quite astonishing, given the proximity of these two islands, the connection historically over the centuries, the phenomenal level of ignorance in relation to Irish history here. And do you think that is to do with deep-rooted attitudes towards Ireland or just a bad habit? Okay. Well, well, I think that... Who wants to pick us up? Um, on the question of um, continuity, uh, don't forget that the Labour Party itself changed its policy on Northern Ireland just before we were elected in 1997. The party's policy was quite clear. We're in favour of United Ireland, um, and that's it. And having changed then to in favour of an island, Northern Ireland, by consent, which was the basis of this agreement, that was an enormous shift. Because what it allowed us to do was to be able to be seen by the unionist community in Northern Ireland as being more 
of a referee than we were of somebody who's on one side or the other. And I think that was big in that. Although, of course, we always got into some trouble um, with the Unis, who regarded the Irish government as very much being involved in the one side of the argument and not the other. I suppose Labour in the 70s had been very supportive of the Unionist position. Yes, I mean, as I said, it changed. But I think that that change towards a consensus consent issue was vital in the whole thing. It really was. And I don't honestly think we could have achieved what we did in the 97 government unless we had changed our policy within the Labour Party, whatever our personal views and I, on I, it. I, I think okay, there, quick, is, quickly, there, John. Is, there is a memory, certainly inside the Labour Party, of the history of Ireland. I mean, not only... Oh, well, it, maybe it's because I was brought up in the west of Scotland. I mean, Michael Collins, I was familiar with. Uh, Wolf Tone, the leaders of the 1798 rebellion, I was familiar with. I mean, um, but I, I think... Maybe this relates to, I think, the second question I answered. Um, I think there is a difference in, in the Labour Party, whatever position people yeah, took in it. I think there was a better yeah. understanding yeah. of the history of our relationship with the island of Ireland. And remember, we weren't an institutional part of what was the Conservative and Unionist Party. And one of the points that hasn't been mentioned tonight is if the DUP becomes, as it did, effectively a partner in government with uh, a Conservative government, and there is no Sinn Féin at all sitting in the British Parliament and no Assembly in Belfast, no then you, you do... <laughs> who's the custodian of the Good Friday Agreement? Yeah. Um, that's, you know, it's, to me it's important, but I don't think for a minute Sinn Féin are going to, you know, come into Westminster. Uh, that's a bridge too far, certainly in the foreseeable future. But it does leave a huge vacuum there into which the old type of politics can emerge. And I think that's very dangerous. Yeah. Can, can, can I just say, I mean, I went into Parliament in 1997. I was astonished at the number of... MPs who were sitting on the same benches as me who had Irish heritage. <laughs> Astonished. It wasn't just people who speak like John and me from the west of Scotland. You know, it was from communities all over the United Kingdom. And if you spend any time with the civil service now um, in Whitehall, as I periodically do, the number of Irish voices, in particular Northern Irish voices that are in our civil service, is quite significant. So, you know, it may be that there are pockets of collective ignorance, but there are also, there's quite a significant amount of knowledge, you know, that comes from people's families and the oral history of their families and their own contributions. I mean, I'm, you know, I don't, I never mention my family in politics, but I'm married to a woman who lost two great uncles, Irishmen, in the Great War, you know. So uh, we're all, quite a lot of us are all mongrel people um, who live in these islands and we've, we've got personal histories. This is the last question. Please. Uh, I think you alluded earlier to the to parties being kind of sacrificed on the altar of this Could agreement. You speak up just a little I don't think our microphone's on, is it? I'm getting yeah. very old. Is it working? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it is now, yeah. Thanks. Um, you alluded to, to parties being sacrificed on the altar of this agreement. I'd be interested to hear your views on the fate of the UUP and the SDLP and are there implications for being kind of the first and most willing to get around the table? Um, so did you the, 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 the UUP the and the Angela, please, please go. I think one of the, the, the great the problems is that they, they really have sort of, it's been one of those things where they've been squeezed. And the fact that the moment, until Margaret Ritchie came into the House of Lords uh, earlier this month, there was no nationalist voice in either House of Parliament, which I think when we're discussing these issues is quite worrying. I had quite um, an argument with um, Conor Murphy about it, because he was saying, but you don't understand, we look to Dublin, we don't look to Westminster but there are consequences for Northern Ireland when there isn't that nationalist voice speaking out. And it's the same with the UUP. Um, but it's since you see that a lot in politics now, you're seeing it over here as well, people sort of moving from the centre. So they did the right things. I remember Seamus uh, Mallon coming to my constituency when I was an MP to speak about what was happening in Northern Ireland, what was important. <coughs> and the interest was phenomenal. It was a packed room in Basildon, 
a um, fair amount of Irish heritage in Basildon, but a packed room to hear Seamus Mallon from the SDLP. So I think it's, it's to the detriment of Northern Ireland that they don't have stronger UUP and SDLP voices. Absolutely. But we have an election coming up this week, <laughs> uh, September the 12th. Perhaps we'll see a change. No, Margaret Ritchie had... Did she not have to resign from the SDLP she has. in order to take a seat in the Lords? So that's not to say that these issues won't be raised. I remember a member of, of, of not the panel, but this man here raising very important issues about the Brexit agreement and its effect on Northern Ireland, which not only did the minister not really answer, he patently didn't understand. And if you don't understand the question, you're not liable to be able to produce an answer that's constructive, but nothing substitutes for people from that area being there and, and, and raising these issues. And as much as I uh, understand the position of the SDLP that they don't like the House of Lords and, and, the, you know, and the Republican movement and Sinn Féin that they aren't going to enter the British Parliament, I understand that and the sensitivities, but there is a downside to it as well and, and that is that there's a vacuum there into which there is now an emerging... I mean, the UUP are now formally part of the Conservative Party, aren't they? No, and I didn't the, tell and the, no, they less come so back out again. The the, so and the DUP yeah. were in practice, um, you know, had huge leverage in the Conservative oh, yeah, government. Sure, yeah. So that, that's, that's dangerous because it's one-sided. OK, so... We're going to wind this up now. Thank you very much indeed, uh, everybody. And, and round of applause again for our panel, please. <laughs>